So for this week, we have Robert Mann, who will be, who's joining us from, um, was it Nottingham, was it? Right um, now, yes. Yes. And who is a professor at the University of Waterloo. Rob will be talking on the holographic chemistry of black holes. Take it away. Okay, thanks, Evan. I, I was asked to say something about uh, uh, that was a little more on the lines of the uh, ADS CFT correspondence. So this is perhaps a bit different from a standard quantum info or RQI talk, but it is work I've done um, a fair amount of over the last dozen years with a number of collaborators, and it's rooted in black hole uh thermodynamics which began more than 50 years ago and one might say it started uh when excuse me when john wheeler was having a meeting with his grad students and they met over tea and he asks what happens if you pour a cup of tea into a black hole which sounded like a silly question, but the concept of a black hole was fairly new then. And what Wheeler realized is that if it truly is black, it has to be an object at zero degrees Celsius or zero degrees Kelvin rather, absolute zero, because it absorbs everything and emits nothing. And if it emits nothing, it can't emit heat. And then comes the puzzle. The tea is hot, so if it were poured into a black hole, you've got a hot object uh, making contact with a cold one, but the cold one won't get hot, which will lower the total entropy of the system and violate the second law of thermodynamics. So where does the entropy go? This became the uh, question that puzzled people. And one of the grad students at the time, Jacob Beckenstein, took the question seriously. And what he realized was this, well, the T is hot, but it also has mass. So when it's poured into the black hole, the black hole will get heavier and therefore it will get larger. Its event horizon will increase. So its area must increase. And I've compressed his thinking. I don't think it came quite as quickly and easily. But what he proposed, as is well known, was that there was a relationship, a proportionality relationship between the area of a black hole and its entropy. And from this emerged, based on work by uh, Bardeen, Carter, and Hawking, uh, the, of the four laws of black hole mechanics, which I've listed here on the screen. The first one is what we might call the zeroth law, and that is that the temperature of a system at, e at equilibrium is constant. And in the case of a black hole, uh, the statement is the surface gravity is constant over the event horizon. The first law is the one written down here that differences in mass between nearby solutions, black hole solutions of the equations of general relativity are equal to differences in area of these black holes multiplied by the surface gravity divided by eight pi plus additional work terms. If the black hole is rotating, there could be a change in angular momentum. If it's charged, there could be a change in charge and perhaps other properties as well. Uh, this is what Hawking formulated after he uh, uh, was able to demonstrate black holes had temperature. Beckenstein, as I already mentioned, came up with the second law that the area of the event horizon never decreases in any physical process, analogous to the way that um, entropy never decreases in any physical process. And the third law was formulated in the 80s by Werner Israel, and it basically states that no procedure can reduce the surface gravity to zero in a finite number of steps. So if you do something to a black hole, 
uh, if it radiates, if you manage, for example, to shrink the area by uh, perhaps throwing in um, some kind of opposite charge, maybe to reduce the area or something, you can't reduce the surface gravity to zero in, in a finite number of steps. So we have those black laws of black hole thermodynamics. So I want to turn to this subject of black hole chemistry and what is it? Well, there was this parallel, as I pointed out, between the laws of thermodynamics and gravity. And in particular, the energy in a thermodynamic system was like the mass of the black hole, the temperature like its surface gravity, and the entropy like the horizon area. But the first law actually is a little bit different. In thermodynamics, in pretty much all systems, there's a pressure volume term. But that's conspicuously absent in the first law. And so one can ask, as Brian Dolan did uh, more than a dozen years ago, where is this term in the laws of black hole thermodynamics? Well, it turns out this term is related to a cosmological constant, as I will subsequently point out. Uh, Einstein introduced this uh, over 100 years ago now in order to obtain a static universe. Uh, if you don't have this in the equations and solve the equations dynamically for a system of pressureless dust, say, the dust can't remain static. The dust was a stand-in for uh, galaxies, which on large scales would be regarded as point-like masses, and the solutions to the equations didn't satisfy philosophical prejudice at the time that the universe was static, so this lambda term was introduced. And today, we actually believe it's an important part of the puzzle in understanding gravity. Uh, in astrophysics, it certainly appears that we live in a universe with a positive cosmological constant, though there may be a different mechanism to explain it. This would be called cosmic tension if lambda is positive. Uh, in string theory, lambda is favored to be negative because uh, it turns out that that particular sign of lambda plays an important role in the ADS-CFT correspondence. So pressure turns out to be related to negative lambda. Here's a system at low pressure. If you push down this little uh, disk, then the molecules of the gas inside will be closer together, bouncing around more, exert greater force on this. This would be a high pressure or greater lambda in the gravitational system. Now, this notion of pressure from the vacuum goes back actually to something I did with Jolien Creighton in the 1990s and a few years later by Padmanabhan and then Do Brian Dolan put it together uh, in a couple of papers in classical and quantum gravity. So I think it's uh, perhaps best demonstrated by an example. There's a formal geometric uh, proof for it. Here's the metric of a Schwarzschild ADS black hole in four dimensions. It's a solution of the previous uh, of the equations I showed you on the previous slide, where uh, lambda is goes like one over L squared. And you can demonstrate that this is an exact solution to Einstein's equations. M here, M tilde, I guess. I don't know why the tilde is there. M is a constant of integration. And K has to do with the curvature of this uh, transverse space here. If you take it to be a sphere, K is one, but you could take it to be a toroid or a hyperboloid or something, in which case K would be zero or negative one. So it's straightforward to compute the total mass of the system 
which is uh, not quite M tilde. I guess that's why I put a tilde there. The actual mass is related to the the thermodynamic uh, is related to the radius of the horizon R plus and the uh, what we call the ADS length or the uh, one over the square root of the cosmological constant L, like so. The temperature is given by this using standard wick rotation methods that I haven't gone into. And the entropy is the area of the horizon divided by four, four pi r squared over r plus squared over four. The pressure, according to these papers here, would be negative lambda over eight pi, and lambda is related to this L squared by being negative three over L squared. So we get this relation. And it turns out the volume, the thermodynamic volume, don't confuse the red V with the blue one, uh, is four thirds pi R plus cubed. So you can then show that the mass is related to the temperature, entropy, volume, and pressure by this relationship right here. This is called the SMAR relation. And it was pointed out in the 70s by Larry Smarr to hold for black holes with zero lambda, in which case, according to this, P would be zero, and you would get M is 2TS. And for quite a while, people were puzzled by the fact that the SMAR formula did not work when you had solutions with a cosmological constant. But what was failed to be realized is that it was that the pressure was non-zero. And when you take that into account, the SMAR relation is satisfied, as is the first law. There now is a pressure volume term, and you can show straightforwardly by taking differentials of these quantities here and here and equating them, then you satisfy this relation. This blue V is this red V. It's not that V. I should have realized the notational confusion. A quick uh, moment, uh, Rob. It looks like Bo has a question. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, Please I, go can ahead. I, can I ask? Um, yeah, the V, the red V. Yes. Uh, it looks like a volume of a sphere, but what is it? it is it a volume of, and what is it a volume of? Well, yeah, that's a very good question, which I was going to postpone to uh, be a little bit later. Um, it is the Euclidean volume of the black hole. It's not the actual volume uh, because that would, how you measure volume of a black hole is quite complicated and it's not clear there is any definite prescription. So the way I call this the thermodynamic volume and it is the, it is the thermodynamic conjugate to the pressure. So if you're willing to entertain the hypothesis hypothesis that pressure is variable in the laws of thermodynamics, then in the thermodynamic phase space, it needs a conjugate. And you can, if you demand this relationship is true, then for this kind of black hole, V is forced to have that value. However, the fact that it is this Euclidean volume is a bit of a misleading coincidence for um, spherical black holes. If a black hole is rotating, then it is no longer the Euclidean volume. The formula becomes more complicated. And, and I think I, I'll show that later on. Um, what I wanted to do was demonstrate in this simple example that these two relations hold. And in particular, if you didn't have P, then you would not satisfy the SMAR relation. And uh, Castor, Ray, and Trashen showed that on geometric grounds that, in fact, you do get a small relation that includes these quantities. Does that help? Yeah, it was very helpful. Okay, Thank physically you very mo motivating this, as I said earlier, this metric solves uh, these equations. And you can regard lambda if you put it on the other side of the equation as the pressure of the vacuum in some sense. If I write this, 
uh, minus GAB lambda as uh, a stress energy of a perfect fluid, well, a perfect fluid is rho plus P times the co-moving four velocity of the fluid or the outer product of the co-moving four velocity plus P GAB. Well, this term has to be zero with, and, and so uh, density plus pressure is zero for a cosmological vacuum. This has been long been known to be true by cosmologists. And P is negative lambda. It's the pressure term exactly like up here. So in some sense, it's not too mysterious from a cosmological viewpoint that, that the cosmic vacuum acts as a kind of thermodynamic pressure on a black hole. So uh, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, Castor, Ray, and Trashen repeated the old Bardeen, Carter, Hawking arguments but they included a, a cosmological constant. And so what was what they found was that enthalpy played the role of mass, temperature uh, and entropy were played respectively by surface gravity and horizon area as before. And they found when you repeated the argument with a lambda that pressure played the role of a negative cosmological constant, or maybe I should say that vice versa. And so one then did have a full restoration of a correspondence between the first law of thermodynamics and the first law of black hole mechanics with this slight difference that H is the enthalpy, which is the energy plus PV, or if you put this into these equations and rewrite it, M is the energy minus rho times V. So if you think about what enthalpy is, in chemistry, enthalpy is the energy you need to create a system and to place it in its environment. And that latter uh, feature costs energy. You've got to, if you like, push the environment out of the way. And in the case of a black hole in a cosmological vacuum, the mass is the total energy minus the energy of the vacuum. And each one is individually infinite, but as Castoray and Trashen showed by these arguments, uh, together they subtract uh, in this way to give a finite value for the black hole. And as I said, these ideas uh, go back to these papers. In fact, there was an intimation in the 80s by Teitelboim that perhaps lambda is a variable quantity. So, Black hole chemistry takes this seriously and regards this as the dictionary, as the basic dictionary of black hole thermodynamics. And we have come to call this subject black hole chemistry for reasons I'm going to describe in the next few minutes. So here's the metric for a D-dimensional Schwarzschild black hole. And it was uh, where K it can be one, zero, or negative one, as I said earlier. Now, Stephen Hawking and Don Page took a look at this system in three plus one when D equals four. And they showed that asymptotically flat black holes will evaporate by Hawking radiation to nothing. But in ADS, the situation is a bit different. It's like a ADS is like a confining box and the radiation will uh, be reflected at infinity and therefore the black hole will come to thermal equilibrium with its own radiation. And so you can get one of two situations. If the black hole is uh, large enough, then the thermodynamically favored state, the state of lowest uh, Gibbs free energy G as a function of temperature is the large black hole state. But they showed that as you looked at black holes of increasingly lower temperature, you reached a point at which the entropy of thermal ADS, of ADS uh, with pure radiation, actually had the lowest free energy, which could be set to zero. And so if you follow these curves, this cusp curve is the black hole curve, and there were uh, 
above this dashed line for temperatures larger than this uh, T min dashed line, there are two possible black hole states, a small one of low entropy that's thermodynamically unstable and a large one of high entropy that's thermodynamically stable, as makes sense. The state of bigger entropy would be the thermodynamically stable state. But once you were lower than this THP, the large black hole had a propensity to dissolve into thermal radiation. Or put the other way around, suppose you were in ADS space in a bath of radiation. Well, as you pumped more and more radiation into the system, once the temperature of the radiation reaches this point, it's thermodynamically favorable for that radiation to collapse into a black hole. And uh, that's what this diagram is all about. The, there, the, once you're in that state, there are two kinds of black holes. The small ones have negative specific heat, like their asymptotically flat counterparts do, but the large ones have positive specific heat. So when you're below T min, you can only have a gas of, of gravitons, perhaps, that's thermal ADS. In this zone here, it's possible to have either radiation or a black hole, but the black hole is th thermodynamically unstable. And when you're over here, the black hole is thermodynamically stable. All right. Well, uh, David Kubiznak and I, showed that, in fact, you can interpret this from a chemical viewpoint. If you look at the coexistence curve, if you plot the pressure of the black hole, which depends on the quantity L that I showed on the previous slide, remember T min uh, depended on L, it went like 1 over L, you can plot the pressure versus the temperature uh, here's an expression for the temperature, and you find in any dimension you get this infinite coexistence curve, which is very much like that of undergoing a phase transition from a liquid to a black hole solid. And this sounds a, a, a liquid to a solid, and it, it sounds a bit counterintuitive. The large black hole is more like a liquid. It has higher entropy. The radiation has lower entropy once you've crossed the uh, Hawking page temperature, and therefore it is more solid-like. Um, this phase transition in the context of uh, conform the ADS-CFT correspondence, which I'll say more about later, was pointed out by Witten to perhaps be dual to the transition um, between bound quarks and a quark gluon plasma state. So from this, if you compute the pressure and the volume, actually the specific volume, which is the volume per number of degrees of freedom, you get this equation of state here, which depends on the parameter k, one, zero, or negative one, uh, which in turn is the topology of the horizon. So if K were zero, if you had planar ADS black holes, they would undergo the Hawking page transition and, and you get the equation of state, which is that of the ideal gas. Um, this quantity little v is called the specific volume and it's the volume per number of degrees of freedom multiplied by six for reasons of convention or convenience, uh, you can show that um, what, well, rather, what we interpret as the number of degrees of freedom is the area of the black hole divided by the square of the Planck length, uh, because that's the smallest area uh, that one can divide something into classically before quantum and gravity effects become important. So when you take V and divide it by A over the Planck length squared, you end up getting this quantity here. We call that the specific volume. And so you get this equation of state. So <clears throat> a couple of years before that, what got David and I involved with this is when we looked at charged ADS black holes and we discovered they thermodynamically behave just like van der Waals fluids. So when I have a black hole with electric charge, 
Um, the metric looks very similar in three plus one, except for this Q squared over R squared term due to the electromagnetic gauge potential Q over R. And it's straightforward to compute the temperature, the entropy, the uh, electromagnetic potential at the horizon, and of course, the pressure, the volume turns out to be the same as an uncharged black hole, by which I mean the thermodynamic volume. And from this, you can show that both uh, the SMAR relation and first law are satisfied. Without pressure, you would get 2TS plus 5Q, which is what Larry SMAR showed in 1973. But in fact, once you have a lambda, the only way to get the SMAR relation to work is to take proper account of pressure volume. So what would the equation of state be for this kind of system if I just regard it as a thermodynamic system? Well, here's the pressure, 3 over 8 pi L squared. Here's the temperature. So I can replace 1 over L squared with the pressure and rewrite the equation to get this which looks like the Hawking page uh, ADS um, equation of state I showed a few minutes ago, but there is now this additional term due to the charge. And if you look at this as a function of R, this is a term that grows positively for small r plus, negatively for small r plus, and then more positively for small r plus. Uh, if I rewrite this, putting in units of h bar and Boltzmann constant and the speed of light and so on, then I find that the pressure is kBT over 2 pi uh, over 2 L pl Planck squared R plus, which again suggests that this quantity should be regarded as the specific volume. And uh, therefore, I, we tend to work in those terms and we obtain this, which is the van der Waals equation for the black hole. And this has all the properties that the standard van der Waals equation has for an ideal gas, or rather qualitatively has the same behavior. The Gibbs free energy can be computed by computing the total action of the black hole using um, well-known boundary methods that include this gibbons hawking york term and a boundary term that ensures the charge of the black hole remains constant and boundary surface terms that cancel off divergences from these other parts so uh in the interest of time uh if you take my, I hope you'll take my word for it that the Gibbs free energy is this function of R plus, and the temperature is a known function of R plus. So you can plot this parametrically, and you discover this kind of structure. When the pressure is large enough, or when L is small enough, then you get this smooth dashed curve. But for small pressures, you get this swallowtail, which is reminiscent of the cusp-like structure for the pure ADS case. But you get a second cusp that has this smaller curve that has this uh, curve here. The lower line corresponds to large black holes, whereas the upper one corresponds to small. Indeed, as you march along this curve. As the temperature changes, the black hole gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and smaller until you get to zero temperature, uh, which would be the extremal black hole. As the pressure gets larger, the swallowtail shrinks until eventually you get to this solid black curve where you have a critical point, which you can see a tiny little kink right where I'm moving my cursor. That would be where there would be a second order phase transition. The crossover, the swallowtail crossover, would correspond to a first order phase transition between a large black hole of high entropy and, as the system cooled, a small black hole of lower entropy. This is like a gas in this context, whereas this is like a liquid. 
Gases have large amounts of entropy, but when it gets cold enough, they condense into liquid, which has much slower entropy. The coexistence curve, if you plot these pressures as a function of temperature at the transition points, you get this curve that ends in this critical point right here. So at low enough pressures, you have, as you cool the system down, large black holes that at this point condense into small ones. Up here, the two states are indistinguishable, analogous to the way that a gas and a liquid are indistinguishable at sufficiently high pressure. And if you're at the line of pressure where the critical point is, you will encounter a second order phase transition at this temperature and this pressure right there. So that was very intriguing to see that a black hole, a charged black hole could behave just like a van der Waals fluid, which is, these are exactly the curves you get for a van der Waals fluid, these two. So we explored this further and then we discovered other chemical phenomena. A system undergoes a reentrant phase transition if a monotonic variation of a thermodynamic quantity results in two or more phase transitions that leave the final state macroscopically similar to the initial one. This kind of thing was first observed in 1904 by Hudson, who published in this German journal, Zedphys Chem. And what he did is consider um, a nicotine water mixture. And he plotted the phases as a function of temperature on the vertical axis and percent of nicotine on the horizontal axis. And he discovered the following. Um, if you had the right amount of nicotine, not too little, not too much, but in this zone here, at high temperatures, there, there was a mixture. They were indistinguishable. But as you cooled the system off, the water and the nicotine separated. That's what happens inside this circle. And uh, uh, on one line, the nicotine was above the water and below it, I think the, the water was above the nicotine. But once you made it cool enough, they became mixed again. So you went from mixed to separate to mixed as the temperature changes. This is what we would call a re-entrant phase transition. And I in just this interrupt you there, Rob. We sure. have a question from Tavia. Yep, uh, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Ivan. Um, thank you, Robert. Uh, I have a question about these, um, these phase transitions. When I understand it's everything asymptotically, right? Uh, and when I think about uh, a fluid, I can imagine that under a symptotic regime, the same fluid, if I change temperature, et cetera, it can change in between the different phases. But can it happen also with the black hole or one black hole uh, cannot change the transition? It's like on the 34 one region of these graphs, or you can change the parameters and also change the black holes among well, yeah, the answer, if the theory is right, is yes. So suppose we had a black hole. Uh, suppose we could put an ADS black hole in a lab, which actually is possible theoretically. I don't know how you'd ever do it in practice. Okay. And suppose it were small. Then as you heated up the environment, then it, the small one would get a little bigger, a little bigger, a little bigger. But once you reached the proper temperature, all of a sudden it would get really big. That would be the phase transition. If I understand your question correctly. Yes, yes, yes. That... Yes, this was my question. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. That's what is supposed to happen. So Thanks. if we go back to the reentrant ones, uh, this physics reports by Kumar and Narayan has shown this kind of thing happens in ferroelectrics and liquid crystals and multi-component fluids and uh, We've also found it to be true in black holes. And that was shown in this paper with Natasha Altamirano and David and me, uh, again, about 11 years ago, or yeah, something like that, 11 years ago. Uh, what we did is we looked at, we turned from charged black holes to rotating ones. And we discovered 
that the rotating ones had a, uh, a line of uh, first order transitions ending in a critical point, um, similar to the charged case. But we also found a small region that I will magnify here, where you had a second type of transition that was also first order. I put it in red so you can see the difference. And what we discovered is that you could go from large to small as uh, the temperature was cooled at a constant pressure within this region, within this region of pressures, fix the pressure, start with a big black hole, cool the environment, it will suddenly become small, but if cooled further, it will become big again. Now, not quite as big as the original, but this is big, to small to big. And this is a reentrant phase transition. Uh, just the way that you go from mixed to separate to mixed, you can go from big to small to big as the temperature increases. So this, uh, in some sense, suggests that black holes are chemical systems there is a line here where it turns out that if you adjust the parameters so that the pressure and temperature is, are in this region, there are no black hole solutions. So you will actually end up at a minimal size intermediate black hole. But nevertheless, in this triangular region, you do get these reentrant phase transitions. Uh, and we since showed that for uh, there are a number in this uh, longer paper uh, with Natasha and Zainab Shakatganad, uh, we showed that um, this takes place in many examples, this reentrant phenomenon. So since then, we found a lot of other results. I've shown you one of them in some detail. Uh, well, three of them in some detail. The BH radiation transition, which is like solid liquid or a liquid gas van der Waals type if the black hole is charged, or reentrant phase transitions if it's rotating. We have since shown that black holes can have triple points that are fully analogous to the solid liquid gas triple point of water. Uh, just, uh, well, actually these papers are published now, I should have updated it, but with Masuma Tevakoli and Jerry Wu, we've shown that black holes can have not only triple points, but quadruple points, quintuple points. They can have multi-critical points of the type that people see in colloids and polymers. Uh, we've, we've showed with Brian Dolan and Anna Kostuki that some black holes have polymer-like transitions with non-standard critical exponents. In other words, the transition is kind of like sand into glass. Uh, so, uh, Eric, Erickson, Joa, Roby Hennigar, and I showed that black holes with scalar hair can exhibit superfluid phase transitions that are fully analogous to those of liquid helium. And that's done in these papers here also with Hannah Dykar. Uh, Clifford Johnson pointed out that black holes can be viewed as heat engines and can be benchmarked for their efficiencies just the way you would for a normal steam engine or some other kind of engine. And uh, Roby Hennigar, Fiona McCarthy, and Alvaro Balan and I showed that, that there was a theory independent limit of 2 pi over pi plus 4 for the uh, upper uh, the, the maximal efficiency you could ever get out of a black hole heat engine if you could ever make one. And on it goes. We've shown that black holes that are accelerating can behave just like thermodynamic systems and exhibit new phenomena where these swallowtails I showed you before can suddenly snap into cusps at a certain uh, value, uh, critical value of the acceleration. Um, Xiao Wen Wei and Yuxi Lu pointed out, and, and I did as well with them in a subsequent paper, that the implications of this work suggest that black holes are more molecular-like in their degrees of freedom. And, and we showed that there is, in fact, one distinction between um, ADS black holes and Van der Waals fluids in that the black holes 
if they're small enough, have repulsive microstructure interactions. Whatever the degrees of freedom are, they appear to repel each other once the black hole is small enough. So let me turn to the main event, holographic black hole chemistry. And the question here is, we have an anti de Sitter space, but there's now 25 years of work or more, actually 28 years of work, on understanding um, anti de Sitter space as being holographically dual to a conformal field theory. And for quite some time, we've been asked how we understand a variable cosmological constant from a holographic perspective. So I'm going to sketch out three main results that we've achieved. Uh, the holographic SMAR relation, complexity as thermodynamic volume, and central charge criticality that, that I think of main inroads into addressing this question here. Now, probably most people listening have heard this, but just in case, uh, the holographic conjecture is formulated in the late 90s by Maldacita and Witten, uh, first done for N equals four super Yang Mills theory uh, being pointed out as dual or conjectured to be dual to a type 2b string theory on ADS5 cross S5, uh, led to this general idea that the laws of physics in the bulk space time can be holographically projected onto a lower dimensional surface of this sphere, and in fact, onto a theory that is a quantum conformal field theory that has no gravitation at all. And this conjecture has led to literally thousands of papers being written. So the question I want to address here is how we understand this in the context, how we understand this idea of variable lambda in the context of ADS-CFT, because the latter has generally implicitly assumed in, in this specific example and others that lambda must be constant. It sets the asymptotic structure out. And in particular, if you write lambda in terms of this ADS length um, L that I showed before, there is a relationship between uh, the ADS length in this smaller space here and the ADS length space in the uh, higher dimensional, uh, sorry, the ADS length of this 10 dimensional world here and the ADS length of this lower dimensional world over here, uh, multiplied by the n in the SUN of Yang-Mills times this root 2 over pi squared factor. And what would this mean? Well, variable pressure will have a variable lambda. There'll be variation on this side. So what is going on with this n? Well, there have been two suggestions put forward. One is that maybe you could vary this integer n in the SUN of Yang-Mills theory, or actually n squared, and that it would have a conjugate chemical potential. But another that I'll explore here is a proposal that originated with Karch and Robinson that the volume of the field theory uh, on this side varies. The volume is implicitly on this side of the equation, as is the con and and that volume would have a conjugate gravitational coupling. So, what Karch and Robinson did is they say, well, let's look at at large n of the SUN. There will be a a free energy of the system which at large n should scale like n squared. And so the overall thermodynamic potential will go like n squared times some other thermodynamic potential. And you can write in the context of the CFT a SMAR type relation between the energy, the temperature of the CFT, its entropy, uh, chemical uh, uh, electromagnetic potential and charge, angular momentum and angular velocity, and uh, the central charge and its conjugate variable mu. There is also a CFT equation of state where the energy goes like the pressure times the volume in the CFT. So they pointed out that if you just accepted this idea uh, here, that you could relate a variable lambda in the variable L 
to the central charge in the problem. And uh, Cedric Sinamuli and I showed that, in fact, if you consider higher curvature terms that included the radius of the uh, dual space, if you like the volume of the dual space, then in fact, the thermodynamic potential is a sum of polynomial functions uh, of omega k's that don't depend on n, but depend on the other variables in the problem. And then we pointed out that uh, in the context of Lovelock gravity, these coefficients had to scale like the Lovelock coupling constants to this power times some other coefficients beta. Um, so uh, if K is one, you have Einstein gravity, in which case this formula, uh, you've, got a, you've got a zero to infinity and you get a constant here. Uh, when K is two, you've got gauss binet gravity. When K is three, you've got third order Lovelock and so on. So you can take variations of the parameters of the Lovelock coupling constants of the ADS length and of these parameters G. And what you end up getting, suppressing the algebra from these relations is a generalization of the SMAR formula to D dimensions that was well known for uh, a number of years, Castor, Ray, and Trashen pointed out this formula should hold. And in evaluating G sub n, Cedric and I pointed out that in string theory, the lowest order uh, loop diagram is an annulus, annulus of a closed string, but higher order non-planar diagrams will look like these crossover wheel structures and they will be the dominant contributions to from the higher order curvature terms. So the terms go like n squared, n to the zero, one over n squared, and so on, as the Yang-Mills coupling constant increases in power. And in general, the kth order Lovelock coupling uh, yields a term that goes like n to the two times uh, one minus uh, one minus k. So if k is one, you get uh, uh, the n squareds cancel. You get n to the zero. If k is two, uh, you put the n squared there. You'll get one over n squared, and so on. So the point of this argument was to show that in fact there were arguments from large n ADS CFT that could give small relations. So a few years ago, I took a look uh, at this notion of holographic complexity, which had become popularized in the, since about 2016 or so. And, and the holographic complexity conjecture suggested that the quantum complexity of a boundary state of the CFT at some time slice was related to either a volume term in the ADS bulk or to the action in the ADS bulk. So there are two kinds of complexity conjectures. In the complexity equals volume, and this volume is not the thermodynamic volume. Uh, I've written this volume with a script V. It is the volume of an extremal co-dimension slice B. So suppose you're on this cylindrical boundary of the ADS uh, space-time, time is going upward, and the space is like the bulk of this cylinder, and the boundary is the boundary of the cylinder. Um, if you took some moment of time on the cylinder, then this volume is the volume of the extremal volume, if you like, of the slice uh, connecting the interior to this boundary. R is some arbitrary length scale and GN is Newton's constant. In the case of the action, you take a point, but you extend it in a diamond-like structure that I've written here on the right-hand side. You could imagine doing it here on the left. And you compute uh, for this given time uh, on the ADS boundary, you draw null lines to the future, null lines to the past, find their intersection points and compute the action 
uh, in this diamond, which is called a Wheeler DeWitt patch. That's what this means, the action in the Wheeler DeWitt patch. And then this quantity here is supposed to be dual to the quantum complexity, as is this volume here. So go the conjectures made by Susskind and Brown and Roberts and Swingle and, and Zhao and, and Stanford in these various papers. So uh, Lehner, Myers, Poisson, and Sorkin pointed out that there is a bit of a subtlety here in calculating these. You have to, first of all, subtract off the background ADS um, extremal volume or uh, action on the Wheeler-DeWitt patch in order to get finite quantities. Um, and they showed there were subtleties in doing that, but they could be dealt with. Uh, further work in these papers showed that there was a general expectation that this complexity volume or this complexity action term scaled like the thermodynamic entropy of the black hole in the interior multiplied by this logarithm of temperature where mu is some scale. This was all based on calculations for spherically symmetric black holes or charged spherically symmetric black holes. What we found is this is not correct. In this set of papers with Raheem El Belushi, Roby Hanagar, and Harry Kunduri, here, we found that in fact, complexity scaled like thermodynamic volume. This V is not this V. This V is the thermodynamic volume I showed you earlier. And it has this scaling property here. The log of the temperature is still the same, and we replaced mu with omega H, but Basically, this is what we find. Um, why is this relevant and how does it connect with what was there, what was found before? Well, if you remember for charged black holes, the entropy goes like R plus squared and three plus one, a quarter of the area, and the volume goes like R plus cubed. These two are not independent quantities, and for most, not all, but most spherical black holes in D dimensions, and certainly the ones that were looked at earlier, again, they are not independent. They both have a scaling property with respect to R+. There's a degeneracy between them. However, for rotating black holes, this degeneracy is broken, and this gets to Bo's question way back when. The entropy of a rotating black hole goes like R plus squared plus the square of the rotation parameter times pi. Whereas the volume has this kind of behavior in terms of A and the angular momentum J. It does not go like the volume unless A equals zero. This, these are both for three plus one. There's generalizations to higher dimensions. So what uh, uh, Raheem, Roby, and Hari and I thought we would do would be to look at rotating black holes and see how the complexity behaves. Um, this turns out to be a rather difficult problem because the null hypersurfaces that draw out the Wheeler-DeWitt patch are complicated functions of the polar angle as well as the radial variable. In fact, so complicated that Raheem and I put out a paper on it. And it was not clear how to match these null hypersurfaces from the boundary to the interior because the Penrose diagrams don't have this same kind of nice structure. Furthermore, as Michael Amseas and Raheem and I pointed out, that if there is charge, you can get caustics forming. So it's not obvious at all how to do this problem. But if you look at multiply rotating black holes in odd dimensions and make all of the angular momenta equal, then you recover these simpler structures. And so that's what we did. Um, it's been known for quite a while, these papers back here, um, that the metric for a black hole in D dimensions, where D is 2n plus 3, can have many rotations, 
you get one rotation for every independent spatial plane. So in five dimensions, you have four spaces, four space directions or two independent planes, you get two rotations. In seven dimensions, you can have three independent rotations and in nine dimensions, four and so on and so forth. If the rotation parameters are all equal, the metric has this structure here where the metric functions only depend on the radial variable with the exception of this guy right here that does depend on the um, structure of these X's in the transverse space. But fortunately, that's not an obstruction to drawing the Penrose diagram. And in fact, if you're in five dimensions, this transverse space is like a sphere and this quantity A is a half cos theta d phi. So these are known in higher dimensions, this function here and this structure here. So what we were able to do in a very long calculation is look at the action on a Wheeler-DeWitt patch because it has this same kind of structure. Um, the null hypersurfaces become quite simple. The angular velocity at the horizon becomes quite simple. The generator of the horizon becomes quite simple in relative terms. And that being said, it was still one of the more complicated calculations I've been involved with in my career. But uh, here's what the final answer looks like for the action in the Wheeler-DeWitt patch minus its ADS counterpart, where you have a factor of two because you've got two sides to the ADS uh, boundary. Um, you end up getting this complicated structure here that only depends on these metric functions, G, H, and F that I showed on the previous slide. And when you grind this out for G, H, and F doing these integrals, we discovered that the complexity scales like the thermodynamic volume over the ADS thermodynamic volume, if you like, runs just the ADS length multiplied by this exponent. So when you had no rotation, this becomes the entropy. But if you don't have, if you do have rotation, then it doesn't. And I think it's easier to demonstrate this with a graph. So on this axis, I've plotted the action complexity in five dimensions divided by vo thermodynamic volume to the three quarters. If D is five, you get three divided by four here. And we plot this as a function of various values of R plus in the different colors. Now, this quantity, if this proportionality is right, as the black hole gets bigger, these lines should approach this constant. And indeed, they do. Whereas if you plot the... Uh, same value divided by the entropy, there is no convergence at all. So it is clear that as the black hole gets bigger, as you go this way, we are getting convergence to this formula, but not to anything that looks like that. We also computed it for volume. Here, the formula is a little bit easier for the extremal interior volume, script V, not Roman V. And again, we found this same kind of thing, that the delta Vc, this quantity here, um, this quantity here, sorry, scaled like V to the D minus two over D minus one. And again, as the black hole gets bigger from 10 to 100 to 1,000, we are converging to this formula. We are not converging. This is... Um, uh, small to big. And in fact, there's a lot of difference between these curves. It's just that these are so much more different that it looks like these are similar. They're actually not. Um, we are not getting that complexity goes like entropy. So I think this is interesting because it's the first time in the ADS-CFT correspondence where thermodynamic volume seems to play a significant role. And we checked this for all higher dimensions numerically, comparing uh, the dimension betas d minus two over d minus one, we find the beta that lets CV go like this. 
and we compare it to what you would have in the volume numerically, and you can see the numbers work out to be the same. So again, to remind you, thermodynamic volume for the multiply rotating holes looks like this red formula. The entropy is this blue formula. They are very different, and the complexity scales like this complicated thing here. And that is the lesson, the second holographic lesson from black hole chemistry, is complexity of formation scales with the volume and not with the entropy. Uh, there's another paper that have shown for Kerr ADS, they had got partial results, and for BTZ that, that they agree with this. So this is not just an oddity of multiply rotating black holes of equal rotation. Uh, and for solitons. So what does thermodynamic volume mean? Uh, it means this. There's an old geometric question that says, what is the smallest area enclosing a given Euclidean volume? The answer in the interest of time, I know I started a bit late, but I'm going to run out soon. Uh, the answer is a spherical surface. And one can construct a ratio uh, that takes the volume divided by the area in a dimensionless manner in D dimensions. And you can show in Euclidean geometry that the volume of any surface enclosed by a given area in this manner is always less than one, where this omega is given by this product of pi over a gamma function. So you can put V for the thermodynamic volume of a black hole, A is a quarter of the area. Uh, or entropy is a quarter of the area, A is four times the entropy. And Shvedich, Gibbons, Kubiznak, and Pope conjectured that all black holes obey a reverse inequality where this is larger than one. And for a 4D Kerr ADS black hole, you get this thing when you compute this quantity and you can show it is bigger than one and approaches one and A is zero. So the thermodynamic interpretation is the entropy of a black hole is maximized by Schwarzschild ADS. So what this means for complexity is that entropy bounds complexity. And in fact, this reverse isoparametric inequality shows the change in complexity is always going to be larger or equal to the black hole entropy. It scales with volume, but it's bounded below by entropy. All right. In the last, do I have another couple of minutes, Evan? Or yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Okay, I'll I'll try to get through this in a, in just a couple of minutes. I want to talk a little bit about the critical central charge, uh, uh, as done in this paper with Juan Kong and David Kubiznak. Um, that holographic SMA relation that Karch and Robinson took a look at we took a look at again. And dimensional scaling suggests that the central charge goes like the ADS like to the D minus two divided by Newton's constant. There is a first law in the CFT that looks like this. There's a pressure volume term and a charge potential term and the mu delta C term. So what we did is we used this CFT dictionary but we allowed Newton's constant to vary. And when you do that and translate using the ADS CFT dictionary, which looks like this for these quantities, we find that the bulk first law becomes this, where now we've got this additional variation of Newton's constant. And likewise, when we take the SMA relation and take this uh, Newton's constant into account, we recover the original bulk SMA relation of castor ray and trash, which I've written in this form, but this is the, if I multiply by P and rearrange, this is the bulk SMA relation. So you can write it in terms of the original variables, but also in terms of the central charge of the CFT and its conjugate potential that I call mu tilde. What we did is rewrite this in terms of pressure so that now you've got a kind of hybrid or mixed bulk first law. And 
as a consequence, the conjugate of pressure is now a different quantity than the standard thermodynamic volume. We called it Vc. And the conjugate chemical potential in, the, in this is not mu tilde. It becomes this thing right here. Um, this satisfies this reverse isoparametric inequality that I stated before, provided mu is negative, which it typically is. And what we found is you can plot, if you remember what I said about 45 or 50 minutes ago, uh, here is the uh, free energy versus temperature diagram for the charged black hole. If you now convert this using the ADS-CFT dictionary, you get a similar kind of structure, oops, where you get a critical central charge on the red line, analogous to this solid black line, where there is a second order phase transition. For larger values of the critical central charge, you get a swallowtail analogous to small values of the pressure. And for small values of the central charge, you get um, this smooth curve here, the dashed curve right there. So there is now a duality where large pressure is like small central charge. And this is the first time that uh, a black hole chemistry phase transition result was converted into CFT language. And that's what we pointed out in this paper. Since then, we have looked at a number of other types of ensembles, uh, thermodynamic ensembles, where you choose what thermodynamic variables you hold fixed and which ones you don't. So you get a whole array of free energies. The ones in black, we looked at these eight possibilities, depending on whether you fix uh, charge, pressure, chemical potential, central charge, uh, volume of the CFT, so on and so forth. You get eight possibilities, and five of them don't do anything interesting, but these three did have interesting phase behavior. Uh, and uh, for an example, if we fix the electrodynamic potential, the CFT volume, and the central charge, we get Hawking page type curves, this cusp, um, for some values of CFT. But as the CFT changes, we get these curves. And this gives us a duality with this confinement-deconfinement transition that Witten pointed out a long time ago, that as you plot, if you plot, sorry, this is as, this is not as C changes, this is as phi tilde changes. And as phi tilde changes, you go from a confined state to a deconfined state over here. And uh, the confined ones are on this branch and the deconfined ones are, are along the cusp. And, and Witten pointed out the cusp is like the deconfined, but we see the confined states right here. If you fix these three variables, charge, uh, CFT volume, and CFT, uh, uh, sorry, the conjugate charge of, of the, sorry, the conjugate potential of the central charge, then you get this kind of structure here where the free energy can either monotonically decrease or produce a cusp-like structure that then goes, oops, back to zero. And you get this rather interesting phase diagram of mu versus temperature, where you've got phases of high entropy, two different kinds of phases of low entropy, one of them unstable, and the white regions are disallowed regions. Um, so there is, this is now an active area of research where a number of people uh, not just in my group, but in a number of groups around the world, are exploring what the meaning is of varying Newton's constant. Uh, we need to see if other black hole chemistry phenomena have found uh, triple points, superfluids, reentrant phase transitions, incorporating higher n, one over n corrections is important. Uh, we've got another paper that looks at some of these questions in detail. But there is a whole lot more to do. So I'm going to stop here um, and say what I hope I pointed out is that black holes do tend to behave like chemical systems. 
And I think this suggests they have an underlying molecular type of structure to their degrees of freedom. I pointed out three holographic aspects of, of this subject that have been demonstrated and are under exploration, but there are definitely frontiers to the subject in understanding dual phenomena to the black hole chem results I mentioned, and of going to positive cosmological constant. So there is still a lot to learn from black hole chemistry, and I'll close with an assessment. Black hole thermodynamics has become black hole chemistry, I might say. And what I think the large scale lesson, I think, from this subject is this. We don't have a quantum theory of gravity yet, but whatever we come up with, it better be rich enough to describe all of this chemical phenomena in some effective or emergent way, or there better be a very good reason why it isn't there if it's not there. Thanks a lot for your attention and sorry if I went a bit over time. No worries, Rob, that was very interesting. Um, do we have any questions? Natalia? Um, thanks again, Ivan. Uh, Robert, uh, you were talking um, about, in the middle of a talk, you told about um, some work where they showed that for very small black holes, they tend to repel each other, suggesting some inner structure on these very small black holes. Did they understand that correct? Yeah, that they have a molecular structure. And for finding this result, did uh, is it necessary to make some assumption on the inner structure of the black hole, or does it come naturally from uh, I don't know from the calculations? Make it it comes, okay, uh, so I suppressed this. Um, it comes from a computation of what is called the Rupiner curvature, which is a quantity George Rupiner proposed a uh, uh, number about on the order of 15 years ago or something. I can't remember the exact date. But basically what he did is he looked at the thermodynamic phase space of a thermodynamic system, not black hole, not black hole, just a thermodynamic system. And he, uh, there's relations between uh, the variables in a thermodynamic space space, pressure, volume, temperature, charge, chemical potentials, all this stuff. And, and so these relations put you on a curved surface in the space in the thermodynamic phase space. So what he did is he looked at that curvature, um, the scalar curvature of that surface for a number of different systems. And what he found was that the sign of the curvature corresponded to um, attractive or repulsive uh, interactions between the basic constituents. So um, what you can do for black holes is compute the same thing. And if you believe Rupiner is correct, if that correspondence, it's correlation, not causation perhaps, but if that correlation carries over to black holes, that's what suggests a molecular structure. And what Xi'an and Yuxi did was go a step further. They pointed that out, but then they also noted that if you divide um, the, if you use the Planck length as sort of the minimal area unit a black hole can have, and then scale that out relative to the area to get a size for the degrees of freedom, the small black holes undergo transition to larger size areas, but they achieve an equilibrium right at a transition point. And they showed, um, again, I'm, I'm really compressing their arguments, but they showed this is exactly the kind of thing that water molecules or other molecules do in going from you know, liquid to solid or gas to liquid. And so it's suggestive, it's not conclusive. But I think the bias in black hole 
thermodynamics and quantum gravity is the degrees of freedom should be subatomic. But we maybe they're not. Mm -hmm. In fact, this suggests they're not. I don't have a proof, but it is suggested. So I guess there's Thanks two other lot. questions here. Is that is that is that okay, uh, uh, Natalia? Yes, yes. Thanks a lot, and thanks for the interesting seminar. Okay. Excellent. Uh, Bo, do you have a question? Yep. Uh, a, a short comment and a question. The, the comment is just on, on this, um, um, the molecular structure. I mean, there's, a, there's an old uh, result in counting of states that uh, uh, suggests that there are sort of a stringy exclusion principle, which would be uh, saying that some states are not allowed and, and uh, uh, because of some uh, sort of excluded volume in phase space and so on, which could be a repulsive and effectively uh, modeling a repulsion. Anyways, uh, my question, say, <laughs> um, I'm I'm faced with the uh, inverse problem. I have a quantum field theory that models uh, lives on the on the boundary and models the bulk. Uh, do you have any advice for me how to compute uh, volume and pressure just using uh, well uh advice i what i would try to do if you had a well defined cft is i would try something like this if you know what this is for the cft i would apply the dictionary which might be a bit modified depending on the cft and i would just try to work through this argument to see what happens um i don't have any other advice uh, and then, um, so then what, if this worked, which arithmetically, I, I don't see why it wouldn't. So you, you would get something analogous to this, where you would be able to compute what these various quantities were. I didn't write them all down on this slide, but you, you can calculate them. Um, uh, so once you knew what they were, you'd have a candidate for a black hole in terms of its thermodynamic parameters. And then the job would be to find what solution it is to a theory of gravity, which may or may not be Einstein's theory. Uh, but but that's that's what I would try <laughs> if, if you oh. had it. Perfect. Then I can vary the central charge. Um, yeah. And the other terms is the pressure and the volume. But that's not the pressure and the volume in the in the yeah the pressure the capital P that's why I used capital P here and uh, small p here they're not the same thing when you work through uh, these arguments and script V I know I, I overused V in this talk especially when I had a metric function but uh, this V and this V are not the same thing. Necessary. You have there is a dictionary between them that's discussed here, and in in a couple of subsequent papers. But yeah, okay. So that's where I go. I go to these papers. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Great. Excellent. And Magdalena. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Thanks, uh, Rob. That was uh, filled with a lot of. Uh, a lot of information. So, my I, I'll, I have two very concise questions that I think they don't go to the the, the biggest depth of what you were talking about. But hopefully, um, yeah, I think they are, should be quick to answer. So, one question I have is, if um, there is some generalization of this um, black hole chemistry, or even if one should expect any generalization in a sense that that this um, thermodynamics or chemistry should apply more generally when there is a horizon, or is it really necessarily the presence of a black hole solution that makes it work? Um, then maybe I'll ask the second question because it's uh, it's very short. So if uh, if you look um, at the um, ADS-CFT, uh, from the ADS-CFT perspective, you mentioned that the um, 
entropy of the black hole um, also includes the rotation. I guess it's something very standard I should have known. I didn't, or maybe I just didn't remember. Is there some way to interpret uh, from the CFT side? I mean, what, what um, somehow just from the point of view of the conformal field theory, where, um, yeah, where, so, where the rotation comes in. Okay, yes, thank you. Yeah, all right. So there's two questions. I'll do the second one and then the first, assuming I understood the first. So let's try the second. So the answer is, yeah, there are um, results uh, for ADS CFT for rotating black holes that um, do work out various quantities in the bulk and relate them to what is conjectured to be on the boundary for the CFT. But at that time, nobody knows what the CFT or nobody knew what the CFT for the rotating black hole was supposed to be. And to my knowledge, they still don't know, uh, or people still don't know. Um, rather, you just suppose there is some kind of CFT and you use the correspondence to uh, investigate uh, properties. The papers on this are by Awad and Chamblin, and there's one by Gibbons and Perry and Pope, and there there's a number of, of others. Um, the problem with the conjecture is it's very well formulated for the Super Yang Mills and ADS-5 cross S5, but the more you depart from that, the less specific the idea gets. And uh, uh, so unless someone else here knows, but I'm not aware that there is a clear formulation of what the CFT is for a general rotating black hole. Rather, what you have are things that are congruent or commensurate with what you expect a CFT to do based on bulk calculations. Uh, uh, so the other one was, do you have to have a horizon to have the chemistry or the temperature? Was that the question? Um, yeah, I guess the question was if it would be sufficient to just have a horizon and then investigate its uh, thermodynamic properties, or is it essential that there is a black hole solution? Because yeah, then black holes would have charge and rotation and cosmological... So, so the answer is certainly... It doesn't have to be a black hole because we know that cosmological horizons have thermodynamic properties. And formally, the inner horizons of black holes have analogous first law relations. Um, depending on how you treat Rindler space, the Rindler horizon uh, can be said to have an entropy per unit uh, area. Um, of the horizon, I mean, the area is infinite uh, of the Rindler horizon, so you, the entropy would be infinite, but there is a way people have thought of maybe scaling them. Um, but it does seem you need some kind of, uh, some kind of, of horizon caused by, I, I mean, modulo Rindler, which I'm not convinced is going to go through, some kind of horizon that has um, uh, other physical properties associated with it, like mass or charge or something. Um, and this, I think, is one of the big puzzles of black hole thermodynamics. Uh, if you have a star that is burning out, it will have a certain entropy. But once it collapses to a black hole, the entropy jumps by 30 orders of magnitude, which, I, I mean, it, it, the equations tell us this, but it's very strange to get such an enormous increase in entropy. And people have thought for a long time that the gravitational field itself should be hiding entropy, even if there aren't horizons. But uh, to my knowledge, no one's ever come up with strong, consistent ideas for how to get that to work. 
George Ellis tried a number of years ago, but it didn't really hold together. For example, that's one person I know that tried it. So it's a good, I don't know beyond that, right? I mean, I think often in physics, we, you know, we look under the light posts because that's what we can, that's where we know how to look. We do what we can with what we've got. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, I have one quick question uh, myself. Um, can black hole chemistry be probed in analog models? Has any work been done on this? Uh, I'd love to see that. I think the answer is a definite maybe. You can certainly simulate black holes going down drains. So what comes to my mind is two drains, right? Two sonic black holes where the speed of fluid near the edge of drain is faster than the speed of sound in the fluid. And uh, perhaps then you could adjust the parameters or the temperature or something to see a transition. Technically, you wouldn't need two of them. One of them should be uh, what you need is something to simulate um, the pressure term if you want to see interesting phase behavior. And I'm told that maybe, maybe, maybe this could be done with things like like liquid helium, um, uh, that that the surface of the liquid helium is like a lower dimensional space, and you can give it curvature that would be like the negative curvature of the ADS space, and then maybe, 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 it it's not it won't be easy, but it's not fully ruled out. If you could do it, then what should happen as you change the temperatures, you'd get a large to a small transition or or maybe a transition from a black hole to no black hole or some such thing, right? Okay. Hmm. That's partly yeah. why I'm nodding, Pam, because people are doing this type of analog work here, but Oh, okay. But uh, it's not cheap to have these liquid helium things, black hole things. And there's a lot of other, if, if there's surface wave to observe the behavior, you've got to observe surface waves, but it's in a cylinder that's about this big. So boundary conditions matter a lot. And, and you've got to model them very carefully and take that into account. So. Okay. Thank you. Uh, do okay. we have any any last questions? Doesn't look like it. Okay. Thank you very much for giving the talk. It was very, very interesting. All right. Well, thanks for inviting me. I'll see you later. Magdalena, I guess we'll talk later today, right? Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.